Okay, so we, we begin with the last part of the, of the day with our panel discussion and um, after the panel discussion or during the panel discussion you can also ask questions uh, at all the time so I will encourage you to do that and you can also ask questions uh, with regard to the keynote speech we just uh, heard from Ming, Ming Feng and um, so uh, Ming Feng I have already uh, introduced you so I will continue uh, to my right uh, with uh, Henning Frank uh, Henning Frank uh, today jumped in and actually he's, uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure that he actually uh, made it and uh, came from Hamburg to, to, Bremen, uh, to Berlin on short notice. And um, so uh, Henning is the CEO of uh, Zinsland and as we've recently been reading in the news, uh, you have merged with uh, Expo, so obviously you will also get some questions on that and, and how that worked out. And um, just uh, as a general note, uh, so we will do it like that uh, with the economics people, the lingua franca is English, and we will continue to speak in English. And for the uh, legal language, I think in, in Germany, it's... Uh, English as well. It's English as well, okay, perfect. So, great, uh, and yes. Yeah, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Udo Franke, uh, who is uh, from the Ministry of Finance, German Ministry of Finance, and actually the head of the department which is in charge of all the regulation that crowdfunding platforms uh, have to deal with. And we have Konrad Rusch here, who is partner at Linde Mann Schwenecke um, uh, Law Firm, uh, and um, who advises, I think, both platforms and also investors in, in, in this uh, field. Okay, so I think we, we should jump right into this topic of uh, real estate crowdfunding, which is, is becoming a really a big market in Germany, and I think it has taken over most of the other types of uh, equity crowdfunding in Germany. And uh, so my question would be to you, Henning, um, why do you think we actually need real estate crowdfunding in, in, in Germany? And I mean, we have a lot of other uh, forms of, of finding, financing of, of real estate, right? I mean, we could also invest in a, in a REIT or something like that. And why do you think we actually need real estate crowdfunding? Uh, first of all, thanks for uh, having me. Um, I, I think we need uh, real estate crowdfunding to the point that so far, if you want to invest in certain um, properties, your only way is buying, like the, 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 the asset itself, being it an apartment, a condominium or whatever. And, uh, or you could actually go into a blind pool like a, like a fund or s uh, something similar. And uh, what we want to do is give the opportunity to people who don't have the money investing in, in huge properties, buying the whole place, um, and, and give them the opportunity to invest in certain um, properties, whatsoever they believe in it, certain cities, certain asset type, um, certain class, certain uh, uh, developer maybe, because you know the developer or you know uh, somebody on, on the team, uh, and, and give those the opportunity to, to invest directly. Um, in addition, um, it's, it's a process that through digital platforms nowadays is, is super easy, super quick. Um, you don't have to go to your, to your bank consultant, uh, read about 60 papers of paper, sign it, send it back. Um, it's, a, it's a process you can actually do in a couple of minutes. And I think that's something in terms of the user experience what people demand nowadays. Um, and yeah, uh, I, think, I think these are some of the possibilities you do have with real estate crowdfunding. Maybe just to follow quickly up on that, so I mean, how you phrase it, it it's somehow sounds like that you can actually invest in your own property, but that's not the case, right? I mean, you're investing in a different uh, property uh, of, of someone else. I think that was always my dream, right, I, that I could buy my real estate using a crowdfunding platform, but it's not really my real estate. So, so the question would be, I mean, what, what you um, outline I guess you could do this if you buy a fund with your retail broker as well, right? So, so can you elaborate on that? Sure. So what we do uh, uh, as Exporo, which I represent now after uh, the merger, I'm sure you have a question around that as well, um, is that we have two product lines. One is we do finance developers. So somebody building a property who needs uh, mezzanine capital for the next two years until the property is built and sold off, 
and you can invest of this you in, into this you get a, a, a fixed uh, interest rate which is will be paid out in the end when the money is paid back and it's not your property obviously um, but at the other time uh, on the other side we also have a product where um, you can invest into uh, an existing an existing multifamily home for example with starting from a thousand euros um, and you also participate in the upside so you participate in the um, rental income but you also participate in the upside if this building will be sold for a higher price in a couple of years so is it your property no it's not but it's quite similar it's i think it's the most similar you can get through by by not buying yourself a, p a piece of land and uh, that's the idea we're having um, moving more into that direction what you actually just described more being it your own and instead of financing somebody else so maybe I continue with the economic side and then we switch over to the... Let's, let's just okay. ask Henning, yeah. uh, can, you, can you talk a little about the market size? Because we didn't choose this general topic for this discussion for, for, for no reason. It's because real estate crowdfunding is by far the biggest market in the whole sort of realm of crowd investing. This is something we, this is the seventh crowd investing symposium. We did the first in 2012 and I think nobody would have expected real estate crowdfunding to become that big. So maybe could you Tell us a little bit about market size and maybe you could also elaborate on the reasons why you think this was such a boom. Mm -hmm. This one it's easier. Um, so in terms of the size, we have a, a platform volume in 2018, which is roughly about 300 million euros in Germany. Um, uh, in, in 2018. Uh, growing, it, it obviously started very small in 2012, 13, the first first crowdfunding campaigns on real estate have been done. Um, last year, 300 million euros in, in Germany altogether. Um, we will be, that's the best guess, about 500 million euros of, of capital uh, uh, in, in this year and uh, it's, it's something that's definitely growing. Uh, I think uh, I think there are several reasons for for uh, why it's it's picking up uh, so quickly. Um, one of the reasons is that that real estate is something people are obviously interested in and has been interested in a long time. And um, as we all know, the markets are, are quite empty if you want to buy right now. And um, so uh, I think that's one of the reasons you, you get an access to a market that's sometimes hard for you to get to, especially if you are not like a, uh, like a high net worth individual or somebody with a high income, um, but you have a couple, couple thousand bucks, you have otherwise no chance participating in the market besides going into a fund or, or read or something, something similar. Um, uh, I think I think that's one of the reasons why why people like to invest in in that case, um, and obviously there's also a bit of a boom because real estate uh, markets have been going up the last couple of years quite significantly, and some people want to jump on the train and and you know they they see other people making money they want to do the same, and I think so it's also besides the fact that there's like a natural growth in it there's a bit of a boom growth in it as well, why why things are picking up quickly. Um, yeah, these, these are the main, main reasons um, from, from my understanding. Just to make point one thing out, if we're talking about mezzanine capital um, in Germany, we are still, th there's not really secured numbers, but it should be a market which is between 10 and 15 billion a year. So Amen. what, all together. So what the platforms are doing, like is still a very small percentage of what actually is happening in the market. A lot of the mezzanine capital still comes from institutional investors or semi-professional investors on an offline analog system um, because they know somebody or they want to invest in a certain in a certain developer. Um, so we are still small in compared to the overall market size, but it's a market that's, as you said, growing up quickly. Okay, so my, my question would be if uh, Germany is doing so well apparently in real estate crowdfunding, uh, how is it working in the US currently? Mingfeng, do you know anything about that? Uh, I don't know too much. I know there are some uh, platforms working on that. I think I've showed some of their logos there. Uh, I think many of them are actually focusing on like accredited investors, like uh, people who have a lot of uh, fixed, uh, a, lot of, a lot of wealth already. So I don't think there's... Um, I think there's a few, but not many, that has kind of been opening up to regular investors. Yeah. Okay, so, so do the Americans just differently invest in real estate in terms of do they have an alternative? So usually if I read the alternative finance report from Cambridge, I see all these very multiple types of uh, investments uh, that are apparently uh, taking, uh, taking place in the UK. Do you know that the Americans are just doing it differently? Are they just with banks or what are they doing? 
I think they are still catching up. So, it, <laughs> so I, think, I think there's opportunity there for sure. Um, but I think it's just uh, sometimes it's the legal hurdle and sometimes people getting used to that. It's just like any new product has a diffusion process. So you guys are obviously in the lead. So <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I think that it was also represented in the, in the publications, right? Because the Jobs Act was implemented so late, we could in Germany always have this, this data up front. And then uh, now the US, I think, is also publishing a lot in, in equity crowdfunding. Yeah. Yeah. All right, okay. so then let's turn to the regulatory point of view now. Um, so let's ask Mr. Franke, what, what is the, we, we heard about the market size and the development, the, the growth. What's the basic view of the Ministry of Finance uh, on this market? Yeah. <clears throat> When the uh, special regulation on crowdfunding was introduced, um, in 2015, there, um, the, the basic reasoning behind it was to alleviate um, um, startup financing, financing of small, uh, small enterprises. And that was the reason why uh, this exemption from the prospectus uh, requirements uh, were uh, introduced. And when we did the first evaluation of the effects of the, um, of the crowdfunding uh, exemption, we were quite surprised that uh, a, a large part, even at that time, um, uh, was going on to, into um, real estate uh, crowdfunding and um, in, in the last uh, two, three years this even um, in, uh, increased this, uh, uh, this part. So now it's uh, the majority of, of financing. And uh, we discussed and we did also this also in our, in our two reports about whether this uh, uh, would be appropriate to uh, grant this kind of um, alleviation uh, for this uh, crowdfunding um, real estate uh, sector, um, because we, on the one hand, thought that um, there might be uh, an effect on, on the pricing, on, uh, on uh, on contributing to a boom in um, in uh, in real estate in uh, real estate prices, and uh, at the same time, there isn't really a lack on on, on bank financing for real estate um, uh, for real estate uh, projects. In addition, um, uh, in in general, uh, bank loans on real estates are quite sure. They uh, uh, there are strict lending standards. There are strict uh, Uh, collateralization uh, standards, and at least some of these um, 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 crowdfunding or real estate uh, financing <coughs> seem to be um, um, non-collateralized and uh, um, um, from, from the uh, pers uh, investor's perspective, they might, be, um, they might be to a certain extent risky if prices uh, go down. In the end, we decided that uh, we uh, let the market uh, decide on where uh, um, investors want to uh, want uh, to invest. Also, into taking into consideration that in comparison to the overall financing of the real estate sector, um, crowd investing is a quite uh, limited part. But uh, we uh, increased. Uh, the, and strengthen the uh, information requirements regarding uh, collateralization of, uh, um, um, of crowdfunding um, investments in, um, um, uh, in, in real estates. So uh, crowdfunding uh, firms uh, uh, must inform uh, the uh, investors whether the loans are collateralized. So uh, the investors have a better Uh, better ability to assess the risks um, uh, when they uh, when they're doing this kind of investments. Maybe can I ask a follow-up question on that? Because I, I would uh, uh, like to ask Henning, like uh, I mean, how are the loans collateralized? Because I have been reading the VEB uh, letters of uh, some of the issuers, and I find it quite difficult to find out what the collateral actually is. So in, in some cases, it was the, the backyard of a, of a real estate prop or of a property. And uh, can you say something about how the collateralization actually work? Sure. So uh, first of all, we, we need to see that products have changed over the last couple of years. So uh, pretty much all the platforms started with subordinated loans with no 
security backup whatsoever. Um, and uh, this is something that has changed. We, we also learned from, from the market and from stuff that happened on the market. And so um, we, we uh, A, moved much more from crowdfunding into crowd lending. So you have the possibility of, of putting security measures behind it. And B, um, as, as Exploro right now, we're doing about 70 to 75% to of all the projects are actually through bonds. So it's not typical crowdfunding anymore, it's not a subordinated loan anymore, it's a bond um, which is uh, moving from a grey market into more of a, a white market, um, more of security to, towards the, the, the investors. Um, and uh, that is something that, that we see as well. Um, in the end, there's always a risk associated to it. It's, it's, uh, you don't get uh, uh, interest rates of 6 7% um, with, with no risk associated at all. Um, but we try to make it as secure as, as possible um, for, the, for the investors. And um, the, the different possibilities, sometimes we, we, um, we, we, we get, uh, don't know the English word, um, we, we get into the, to the Grundbuch. Uh, and and uh, so uh, we, we're trying to, to secure the loan as, as, as well as possible, but uh, bank is first, obviously. Um, we, we sometimes have projects which are not actually where not no bank is involved. Then it's a bit different, but uh, bank comes first. But uh, that's uh, also a different interest rate, and uh, but the, you, you wouldn't hardly ever find any subordinated loans on the platform, or you don't find any subordinated loans with any risk. Uh, uh, sorry, with any security on the platform anymore. Okay, so Henning just talked about some trends in, in the market, or at least how Expo or Zinsland um, changed contracts or, or the trends you see. Let's ask Konrad Rusch, who has an, an overview of, of the market. Is that representative of all platforms, of what, what platforms are doing? Where, where do you see trends and what legal or what challenges for legal advisors are connected or associated with those changes? Yes, um, there, is, there is definitely a trend towards bond real estate crowdfunding. <coughs> Um, and uh, that is that is developing. You, I, I have several clients who are moving towards that direction, and um, one of the reasons uh, is exactly that reason which you've mentioned. Um, due to our banking supervisory law in Germany, um, we have to take the bond route in order to do certain things, um, namely create security. Um, if, we, if we do it with a normal loan, then uh, we need to do it with a qualified subordination loan with a, with a, with a very significant qualification and subordination in, in, the, in the loan document, because otherwise the, lend, the crowd would be doing um, credit business and would actually need a, a banking license. Each individual would need a, a banking license. Uh, and also the issuer would need a banking license. So um, that is the driving factor why uh, this uh, real estate crowd lending market started with this subordinated loan model and I think that uh, is, it is, the trend is moving away from that but it is still there and um, I'm actually very curious to see what, what model will actually um, um, make the race. Um, I'm not sure that the standard uh, qualified subordination model is, is out of date. I, I don't really see that. For the following reason, which you also, also already mentioned, there's always the bank. There's always the commercial bank uh, on ahead. Yeah? And they have to take the senior security uh, for banking supervisory law reasons, for, because of very strict uh, banking supervisory law standards, so they have to take the senior security. And then um, if you take the second tranche land charge or whether you take no land charge, sometimes it doesn't really make a difference. And then you may find that it's actually much, much more efficient to do a normal subordinated loan rather than um, a bond structure. So that's how I see this thing about the bond uh, trend. And other part of your question was uh, sort of um, the, um, the, the, the challenges. Um, uh, which I see um, 
in the market. I mean, I, I always see it through the lens of, of through the eyes of our clients. You know, uh, so uh, those are a number of uh, crowd lending platforms. Um, uh, so I don't see it, the whole of the market. I, that's, I have to make that qualification. But uh, there's a number of uh, crowd lending platforms, and we also do uh, due diligences uh, um, for for investors. So then we also see other platforms uh, which are not really our clients, but we can we can look at them because we're doing due diligence. And so so what are the challenges? I think um, one main challenge is actually um, I would call it regulatory stress. Yeah, um, and I'm. <laughs> Uh, because there is a lot of regulation, the regulatory waves coming over the platforms in rather um, short iterations, reiterations. And actually, most, almost all of this regulation has a good reason. Um, but the way, it is, the way it is implemented and, the, the, uh, and also the timing in which it happens actually causes a lot of stress. So I see a lot of the in-house counsel dealing um, a lot with uh, with regulation and actually watching the, the legislation process, and, um, and now we have uh, have Franke uh, sitting next to us. So I, I I really have to say it's 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 not really the drafting of the of the statute which you which you do uh, in at the BMF, but it's also um, it's 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 really the the timing and I will give you and and it's the preparation of the of the supervisory authority which is the BaFin yeah I'll, I'll just give two examples um, one example now uh, we, we have uh, early early November and uh, on the first of January there is going to be um, um, an, an amendment to the German anti money laundering law now we have a lot of international guests here you don't have to do and so what is that? No, well, it's it's an important law for for the crowd lending platforms. It has to deal with know your customer, and it is a potential conversion killer. Um, put simply, yeah. So if you uh, if you have traffic <coughs> on your website and you have to show them, oh, can you please go to the next post office and show your ID, and then can you please come back? Then you are not going to see him again. Um, so this um, AML thing is is actually quite an important. Um, Issue, and I think it is to say that right in front, right, right, right at the beginning. Um, I think it's absolutely correct that crowd lending platforms should be um, should be obliged entities under the AML laws. I think that's right um, because you can invest a lot of anonymous money over these platforms. So I think it's actually quite right that that should be uh, that they should be obliged entities. But you know, uh, it's now early November and. There hasn't even there's there's been the first hearing of this statute last week, and it's going to be enter into force on the first of January, and there is actually no pressure for this because um, uh, there is no EU directive telling us to make uh, crowd lending platforms um, AML obliged entities. That's an autonomous decision of the German legislator. It's a good it's a, it's a, it's a good decision, I think. But you know, I, I sometimes wonder why does it have to be now in such a rush? Um, I can see the the, the long-term uh, motivation because we'll, we'll talk about this, I think, also uh, in a minute. Because in the long term, the crowd lending platforms shall be um, shall be supervised by BaFin and no longer by uh, local authorities as at the moment, which is also a good idea, I think. Um, and so, in order to prepare that, they should also be under AML obligations, anti-money laundering law obligations, just like all the banks and all the uh, brokers and, and so on. Um, so I can see that point, but really, I mean, you get the point. I'm, I'm, I'm now pitching for a little extension to, to, to my left. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because it would be actually uh, in compliance with EU law to do so. Um, so that's one one example where we where I just find th what is what is the challenge? It's it's really this the stress that is uh, sometimes uh, created. And the other other example is is is, is coming uh, is one which you already mentioned. It's about also a very sensible thing uh, to do. You've obliged uh, so the, the legislator, uh, which is all of us, which is the democratic lawmaker. Yeah. So the lawmaker has obliged. The uh, lawmaker has obliged the platforms to put into their information sheet also information about the security, because we've just heard it's important. Uh, and 
um, that that um, uh, that entered into force in the middle of July, I think, and it was also just like six weeks um, uh, between the passing of the law and the entering into force. And the officers of Bafin they had no idea how to how to read it, and they didn't know what to do with it. And I had really strange discussions with uh, Bafin officers about what this means, and um, because the point is it should be the idea was actually quite simple it should be it should say in the in the information sheet what is the security but for us it's quite quite difficult to explain because there isn't really security because it's subordinated security and it's a bit of a contradiction in itself to have subordinated security and so we have to explain that and all in in, in, in like uh, five lines big challenge and I think it would I think the, the law is perfectly fine you could do a workshop with the Bafin officers. That's just a, a suggestion because I think they, they, I mean, they, they are perfectly uh, educated to do that and qualified to do it, but they just had, didn't have the time to get prepared. So and then, actually, one or two uh, crowd lending projects had to go on hold for a month or so until these things were. And so you know, the real estate developers had to wait for their money for like a month because uh, nobody knew how to read the new law. <laughs> So, well, we, we have a real panel discussion right now, so I would just ask Udo Franke, would you like to respond? Yeah, maybe two or three uh, remarks. Regarding this uh, AML <coughs> issue, that's uh, uh, luckily, I must say, not on my desk, it's a colleague uh, that is uh, uh, responsible. Um, but uh, as far as I understand, um, the um, amended directive has to be put into, uh, uh, has to be implemented into German law until the 1st of uh, January. So we are in a, in a rush to implement this, uh, uh, this amended AML uh, requirements and, and that it's now a decision to go above that, to make the German market, not only with regard to crowdfunding, but with regard to a lot of other issues, more AML resistant. Or, and uh, and um, um, therefore, I can understand that this is a, is a challenge for for the market. But I must also say it's a challenge for for lawmakers. There was a public hearing on uh, on Wednesday. Next uh, next Wednesday, the final reading will be in the uh, in the in the parliament or in the in the. Um, uh, in the committee and then in the parliament, so it's a very, even for the lawmakers, a very um, short-timed uh, process, and uh, that's a general um, uh, this, um, uh, decision on, on uh, to uh, enlarge the law, and then I think it's also to a certain extent legitimate for this kind of a not to uh, to foresee um, exemptions for certain for certain kinds of uh, uh, financing uh, tools um, regarding uh, the implementation uh, challenges I must say I am I was not aware about that um, uh, I can I can see um, or I can understand that it's a it's a challenge but the uh, the goal was also to provide the market with alleviations. You also know that yes. um, there were the, the, uh, the kinds of instruments that were allowed for crowdfunding, uh, or that are allowed for crowdfunding, were enlarged by, by the law. And I think this was very much welcomed by the, by the market, and the market would certainly uh, welcome it more to have this six months earlier than six months later. So I think this, every time new um, regulations must be put into place, there are some, some frictions, but I hope that this can be, can be solved. In, on, on, and, and, and I think the BaFin in itself is good world. So uh, therefore, I, I will can ask for some understanding of the challenges. Um, can I just of, of course. <laughs> very briefly understood. I didn't mention that in the same law, the, the threshold for uh, prospectus-free crowd lending was, 
was increased from 2.5 million to 6 million. So that was an, an, a significant um, alleviation for the market indeed. And so that's just me, the advocate, only making the points that are uh, left. <laughs> and um, so that, that's actually correct. Um, that's all. So I wanted to. Um, thank you. Th this actually is, is quite a good point. Um, since we have many economists here in this in, in our group, um, um, just just maybe first, um, we, this this is what economists call an external shock, right? It's it's an ex external event, and we can it would be interesting to find whether it has any consequences. So maybe let's just very quickly, Henning, do you think that the 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 fact that it's that you can invest now or you can issue um, subordinated profit participating loans not only up to 2.5 million, but up to 6 million has any effect on, on, on your daily, day to day business? Uh, a small one, mm -hmm. um, because uh, something I w I'd like to mention uh, to what you said a couple of minutes before about uh, subordinate loans versus bonds in a general context and what, which one will be the one coming in first. Um, you have to see that a issuing a bond is just much more expensive than a subordinated loan. So if, if you have a project that uh, needs to be financed, let's say 800K, it's not worth it whatsoever to, to issue a bond. Nobody will do this. It's way too expensive. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we have to go through, uh, or we are going through um, more bonds now than we did one year ago because our projects in general are bigger. Now obviously for somebody who who's not allowed to issue bonds, it's, it's obviously a big help if he can finance now up to 6 million rather than 2.5 million. On, on the downside, um, the limit of the subordinated loan is uh, it jumped from 10k per person to 25k per person, but there's still a limit. So you still need a lot of investors to really fill a 5 million subordinated loan. And there's not too many platforms who can do this, who have that amount of investors. So I think there, there in theory, you will see, be, see more and more subordinated loans and bigger, bigger sizes um, in the next couple of years. But in the first moment, um, I think there's not like such a big difference um, uh, to, to the market. We already had the first question, but I would suggest we just continue for maybe 10 minutes and then open the floor to, to Absolutely, questions. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. So I, I would like to ask one more question uh, to Ming Feng. So the, the legal scholars are apparently is um, more interested in, in, in thresholds and certain amounts uh, to protect <laughs> investors. And uh, so so for me, this is all, and I have to, 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 to apologize mumbo jumbo in a sense that, you know, it doesn't matter whether you invest 10,000 euros or 9,000 euros if the money is gone, it's gone, right? So the question uh, for me would be, I mean, can technology or the platforms itself uh, also protect investors? And if they can, how would that look like? And I think you have investigated in your papers already different uh, mechanisms like auction mechanisms and uh, posted price mechanisms. And uh, would you say there's, uh, that there is a way that technology can actually help? Thank you, Lars. <clears throat> so I think... <clears throat> Sorry, the jet lag. I think that's a very um, important and also a difficult question. I remember there's a recent issue of, um, I can't remember whether it's Bloom, uh, Bloomberg or, or Economist. The, the cover page is the Tesla's new system is going to save millions of lives, but it's going to kill uh, millions of lives and kill a few people first. So I think that's always a dilemma for technology. So I think ultimately it can help, but I think uh, there's also going to be a lot of challenges in that process. So for instance, um, for platforms, one, of course, we need to take into account their incentive, right? So they, they are profit-maximizing profit organizations, so we should respect that. But on the other hand, um, sometimes they'll create a conflict. For instance, uh, if you want to protect uh, small uh, investors, for instance, or if you want to protect the borrowers, uh, make sure that they are not biased against on certain protected information bases such as race and gender. Um, one thing we need is to actually, for instance, if it involves any kind of algorithm, we need to know what actually is in that algorithm. But that would may, may not be easy to do. And uh, by definition, because some of the algorithms are proprietary, so they, they are belong to, I think, uh, as Lars probably uh, 
know more about is they could put, probably belong to business secrets, right? Right. So they have a right to keep the, some of the things uh, private, but uh, so that I think is always going to be a, a intricate balance between the two. So how you want to protect the uh, investors and borrowers, but also you want to protect the interests of the platforms who develop these algorithms in the first place. So, but I think ultimately. Technology will help if you have the transparency and the large amount of data to train a lot of things and detect not just biases in algorithms, um, but also in other places. For instance, um, I think uh, if you want to protect small investors, uh, if small borrowers, for instance, in B2B lending context, um, it's not just the platforms we need to look at. Sometimes, um, because the loans, when they are originated, it's not just the decision of the platform to list them on the, uh, on the website, but it's also the individual investor's decision whether to lend to that person or not. So if you do see some biases at the end results, who gets funding and who doesn't get funding, uh, it, it could be, yes, it could be platform, but it could also be the individual investors. So it's very difficult for us to, to disentangle who is actually accessing that bias and whether somebody should be punished or not. So I think technology, data, and then many other things are actually all at play here. So uh, it, should, it should be able to help, but uh, I think there's going to be a lot of challenges that we have to deal with as well. So. Okay, so, so one of the platforms with, which has used technology recently is, I think, uh, Exporo, because they have implemented the blockchain technology um, and when extending loans. So Henning, can you say anything about uh, why you did this and why this would actually help investors and why that's a good thing? Or maybe it, it's not and uh, you don't believe in it because you, you were still the, the CEO of Zinsland at the time and you think it was a terrible thing to do, but now you're in it and uh, can't do anything about it anymore? Or? If so, I wouldn't admit it. Um, no, I think it's actually a great idea. Um, the uh, the the idea why we why we use uh, blockchain technology um, to to uh, for for the bond is that it enables us to do um, any sort of uh, of of, of uh, transfer much quicker. So uh, otherwise, you need the banks. You need a, 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 a depot. Uh, sorry, a depot with a bank. Takes a couple of days till till actually the investors see that they that they have the uh, bond in their depot. It's always a, a hassle for the investors. You know they they paid the money and uh, after five days they still don't have it in the depot. Um, and uh, another uh, reason is that if we you talked about a secondary market as well and uh, how it uh, affects the the primary market. Um, the secondary market is not that important if you're talking about a, a financing of a developer for two years because most people don't need liquidity within these two, two years. But we're talking about a, a yield-based property with a bond for 10 years. There might be some people who want to sell it before. So creating a secondary platform or a secondary market is obviously the, the, the blockchain helps a lot. Um, it's, it's much quicker, it's much more efficient. Um, and uh, in terms of the cost structure, just by seeing the cost that we need for Clearstream and, and the dep depot banks and so on, we can save more than 90% of that cost by going through blockchain, which is obviously something we can pass on to, to investors through higher yield. And so it's, it's A, it's uh, I think a better user experience, and B, it's, it's higher interest rates, which uh, I think both uh, investors really like. But if I have anything learned from, from the legal scholars, uh, it's that you actually want to have a repeat player who is in the market for a long time and builds up a reputation, right? And then now you're building this on the blockchain, so I guess uh, who's holding the blockchain? It's not decentralized, right? That might be bad in the first place if it's decentralized. Uh, but I guess it's, it's held by, by ex and operated by Exporo. And I would say, well, this is a very young player, right? I mean, if it defaults, then it's just gone. Um, so, so why should I trust uh, someone to hold this blockchain very, very recently only? Well, first of all, we work, work with a partner here. Uh, we don't do everything ourselves. I'm a big believer of an of a infrastructure system. I, I don't think you have to do and know everything yourself. Um, you can combine players in the market who are better in certain fields you are. Uh, and so um, it's, it's not, uh, we, we don't have the XPower e-wallet. It's uh, something that obviously our investors see on our platform and when, when they log into their account, but the wallet itself is with one of our partners and um, that's where they, where they see the, the investment. Um, if you uh, really do not trust blockchain, honestly you shouldn't invest in anything blockchain related. It's, it's, uh, I think it's a, a simple thing that everybody should uh, only invest in things he believes in. And uh, we do obviously have uh, uh, bonds as well as uh, uh, crowd lending um, 
without any blockchain involved and if this is something you don't trust don't don't invest in it i, I think uh, it's it's quite secure i think it's the future and um, it helps our investors you just said future so let's look into the future um, for the last part of this, this discussion. So, as everyone knows, there is a big thing. The next big thing will be the EU regulation on crowdfunding platforms. And, of course, this is a European um, legal act, but as I understand, the <coughs> German Ministry of Finance is closely watching the whole process, or at least participating in some form. So, let's maybe just ask Mr. Franke, what do you think will be the most interesting topics, challenges of this legal act? when it's passed? At this moment, um, it's uh, in the final stage of uh, negotiations and so-called trilogue, and the Finnish presidency wants to finish this trilogue uh, in, uh, until the end of this year. We we'll see this, uh, uh, this is, uh, well, this is uh, realistic, and there are s still a couple of uh, issues that are, that are open there. The, um, um, uh, crowdfunding re regulation, um, according to the um, uh, uh, proposal made by the Commission, encompasses uh, securities, transferable securities, that means bonds and, and shares, as well as, um, uh, as loans. And um, uh, now the discussion is in, in, um, in the trilogue whether to broaden uh, the scope, to uh, also inc uh, include other, um, other instruments, uh, including uh, limited liability uh, uh, company shares. Uh, we don't uh, have this at the moment in, in, in the German crowdfunding uh, regulation. There was, a, uh, there was a discussion among this, among in, in, in the parliamentary field and also among ministries to broaden it, but in the end, uh, the decision was not to do that because um, in the German law uh, for limited li liability companies, um, there are provisions that are not really adapted to a broad investor space. Um, uh, the, the idea behind uh, the Limited Liability Companies Act is that there is a small and limited group of investors that come together to create a, to create a, an, a, a company and also transfer of, of shares is, is a burdensome process with a, a notary notification uh, required. So in the end it was not included in the crowdfunding regulation. Uh, now there is some pressure from the from the European side to um, uh, to broaden this. This will um, uh, um, uh, a question uh, that will be interesting for also for Germany, and uh, what will be certain will be that um, bonds crowdfunding with with bonds with uh, financial instruments with uh, 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 securities will then be able to also be done on a cross-border basis. At this moment, we have opened this possibility up to 8 million euros for in Germany uh, to uh, sell bonds on crowdfunding from, uh, platforms without a prospectus, only with an information sheet. Uh, this will, will be possible if the um, regulation comes into, for, into force uh, at the European level. And there the, the, the question is what limit will apply, 8 million, 1 million, or something in between, or something that will be differentiated between member states, because uh, the exemption is a mandatory up to uh, 1 million, and every mem member state can increase this limit up to, up to 8 uh, million for its territory, and there are some certain member states that have uh, uh, only increase it up to uh, uh, one million, and they don't want that uh, foreign uh, crowdfunding platforms are able to enter their market up to eight million um, uh, euro uh, uh, prospectus exempt uh, offerings. These are the questions that are uh, uh, open, and um, this is certainly an issue that will alter the current landscape for crowdfunding. Um, I, I will definitely come back to this, uh, to the um, German liability, uh, limited liability company, 
issue because I think that's very interesting, but I think the point you made at the, the, the very last of your, of your points I think is a general point because what seems to be the problem to me is that this regulation tries to create a level playing field for crowd investing platforms in Europe, but it does not regulate the product market. So can, I mean, I don't really know how this should work. Can we have a real level playing field on the crowd investing market if we don't have the same regulation on the product level? Uh, Konrad, do, what do you think about this? Yeah, I think that's one, that's one of the big um, issues which I recommend that you just take into the trilogue, actually, because that is an open question, that's, an op that's a point which I don't find resolved in the current draft of, the, uh, of, the, of this regulation. Um, just today, uh, one of the participants here showed me the, the most recent draft, which is from June, I think, and in that draft, um, the, there, is a, there is a very peculiar phrase in the preamble which says that um, the members, it says in the preamble, which is not the operative part of, a, of regulation, I don't want to bore the economists, but you put the operative part into the, into the, into the articles, you know, and in the preamble you say what you want to do and why you do it. And in the preamble it says um, the member states shall ensure that the regulated platform, that if the regulated platforms do cross-border projects and also cross-border lending projects, so if they use the license, then, the, um, uh, then this activity shall not be deposit-taking business, yeah? um, neither by the crowd lending platform nor by the issuer. So the regulation says, if you, use the, if you use this license, then even for a loan project, then it shall not be deposit-taking business. And that's, for, for, for us, that's, that's <coughs> quite, a, quite a spectacular thing because the German, um, the German uh, banking supervisor law since I think 50 years is different yeah? because it says that is actually deposit-taking business. That's why we do this subordination stuff. Um, so I think, and I didn't really understand the regulation draft on that point at, uh, at this stage. I think it is, I don't, I don't really understand uh, why it's not really addressed. I think that is something that should be, uh, should be really discussed and well, as a practitioner, I would hope that um, we get a level playing field because um, the platforms are really keen to do that. So it's fine that they can, that they can uh, uh, approach investors all across Europe, but they also want to offer, um, let's say, a German product in, in Spain, and they want to offer a Spanish product in Germany. And that requires, as you said, a level playing field on the product basis. I think just to be fair, um, we should mention that we have that level playing field on, on both the, the services market and the, the product market when it comes to securities, right? We, we have all of that yeah, yeah. when it comes to securities. So all, we, we, are, we just talk about the stuff b below the security line, so to speak. Exactly, the small stuff, yeah. yeah. Do we need a, a single market for this? Um, I'm, I'm not so sure, actually. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Of course, we, we have a lot of new noise traders in securities markets as well. No, but um, I, I I get your point, and um, and I think it's and I think you can save. I mean, it, it, I think you can make a fair point that we actually need this, and that it would actually be a good idea. So I don't want to 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 really ridicule that. But I think you wanted to respond directly to this, or did I misunderstand? Yeah, I could say one or two actual words. Um, that's uh, a challenge. And uh, it's my understanding that we sh um, should very carefully then look at the um, that's German regulation, at the German Banking Act. And uh, as this is a, uh, would be a regulation that would be applicable uh, directly, um, the this it's um, there's a case to. Um, yeah, to amend the uh, the Men's and Banking Act, or to 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 bring it into line with um, uh, with the uh, with the regulation, if the regulation stands as it is. Let's 
Um, so, uh, Mr. Franke actually has to leave in 10 minutes, so why don't we open the discussion to, to the floor? Or do, well, I, would I, I would have asked one question for the future of uh, the, okay. the economists. So, I mean, if, if economists think about the future, I mean, they're always thinking about the interest rate, right? So, um, and uh, the saying is, like, everything that goes down, like the interest rate, can also go up uh, at some time, right? And even though the the um, central bank in the U.S. is now decreasing uh, interest rates, um, Ming Feng, you have um, followed Prosper by heart, and I think you know the data like uh, for for a long time. And the question would be: I mean, you have seen a lot of shocks, but what do you think will happen if interest rates increase again? Uh, will you see that these platforms are just completely defaulting because they are just so much on the edge? Or what is your feeling on on, the, on that? Um, so I think there are several angles. If interest rates increase, I think we, we should uh, expect that some of the institutions will pull out, uh, maybe because they can find more um, profit, profitable opportunities elsewhere. But I think the platforms already knew that. So that's why they have the whole loan programs. They, like Lending Club, have about, I think it's still the same. They, all the loans, they put in into half of them into whole loan programs, and then the rest will go to the crowd. So, um, so I think they knew that, and then they are, they are preparing for that. So how that affects the rest of the population, I think it's still hard to say. So uh, I wouldn't expect like a mass default. So, <laughs> yeah. okay. so, so the question would be, is Exporo prepared? I think it's hard to say we are prepared for everything, because you never know what's, what's coming. But um, in the end, interest rates will at some point uh, go up again. I think that's uh, not a question of the if, but more of the when. Um, to me, uh, at the, in the end, the product we're offering is, is um, uh, risk associated. So um, if overall interest rates are going up, our interest rates are going up. The interest rates that real estate developers have to pay are going up. And that's not only uh, with regards to, to crowdfunding platform, but also with regards to the bank. So. We, because we have a, certain, a different level of, of risk associated, we are above the interest rates of uh, the ones the, that the that, uh, developer would pay to a bank, and this will stay the same. So we will always be above that. And um, if it's now 6% uh, on the platform versus, uh, let's say, 1%, uh, if, you, if you put your money on, on the bank somewhere, then it's maybe uh, 9 against 3. So the overall uh, uh, difference will, I think, not crazily change. There might be obviously some some ups and downs in there, but if the overall market goes up in, in terms of the percentage, we, we do as well. All right, let's open the floor uh, for the discussion. First question, why don't you just... Okay, yeah, so, so we're recording this. I think everyone is, is aware of the fact, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, Carsten Menzlaff. So the, um, the interesting thing is I want to say for having this European perspective. Number one is, in Germany, why the law is so peculiar is not so much because the Ministry of Finance isn't competent enough or something like that. It's quite the opposite. I think Mr. Franke and the crowdfunding platforms have, had a, have a very good relationship, and I think the Ministry of Finance has been very good in terms of keeping a balance between consumer protection and making sure that transparency and so on, but at the same time putting enough liberties in the market to allow it to grow and so. And the same is regarding to BaFin. Uh, BaFin is also, I think, very good uh, compared to other supervisory agencies in Europe in approaching the market directly. And also your, both of your studies uh, for the evaluation period for uh, last time was really good. So I think there's a good connection between the academic world, which is here, the platforms, uh, which is presented by Henning, for instance, and uh, the government. But where it is sort of p the problematic issues are um, that in Germany, unlike in other big European countries, um, there's a lot of sort of crunchiness going on in terms of that uh, what is a good intention of one side of the government doesn't necessarily result in a good um, impact on the other side. And the small countries in Europe seem to be able to manage this a little bit better. For instance, the Slovakian government has set up a small fintech workshop where they invite uh, government officials, supervisory agencies, platforms, fintechs, and academics, and they speak about 
issues which are you know on the hearts and minds of the industry and they get the results from from the academics so this is something i think needs, would be interesting to hear uh, across europe how that if that works better but i want to ask you how you see that in the us because you, you see you, i mean is your research used in the formulation of regulation or would you like to have the regulation list more to the academics because you have done these papers but you have published them two years after you had these shocks so maybe by that time the regulators were already a few steps further yeah that's a very uh, valid question so i think that's it's right, yeah. uh, always a challenge that we have to deal with as academics right so um, the reviewers are hard to convince and that's um, but i think also from the reviewers point of view uh, for them, the biggest uh, goal is to make sure that you produce something in the journals that are long-lasting. So that's what I got from senior scholars in the field, and I think that's the common kind of uh, understanding across the social sciences. Uh, so I think if you are in computer science, then you worry about the timeliness much more than uh, other uh, like general business school fields. So yes, we hope that is something that lasts, but of course there are more replication that needs to be done to validate them. So. Hello, uh, Jens Engelmann from Funding Circle. I just wanted to comment on the, um, on the Euro European perspective because I was quite surprised that this is actually being challenged. Um, and and from, uh, from a platform's point of view, it is, I think it's really important to, um, to have a level playing field in, uh, across the European Union because at the end of the day, it's, it's a game about scale. So, um, and, and the one reason for which platforms stay in their home markets and they don't expand into other, in, into other countries is actually that um, different regulation is the main entry hurdle for, um, for expansion. So um, I think it, it is really important and it, it's a really, really good and promising step. And it's also um, from an investor perspective, I think very much um, um, very, uh, very, very positive in the end, because all over Europe we don't really have bespoke platform regulation. Um, <clears throat> which would really, um, which, which is really tailored to the needs of retail investors. So in Germany, um, for example, it's, it's quite clear that um, the regulation in the FinFam V, <coughs> sorry, does, doesn't really take into account um, the, the way how, how platforms operate. And um, um, so for, for this reason, I think this is really um, a very positive uh, initiative. And also on the, on the banking monopoly side, where um, um, this banking monopoly only exists in Germany, that actually the counterparties would, would require banking licenses. And if we want to have a, ba a level, level playing field, then this in fact is, is the main prerequisite to, uh, to establish this playing, uh, level playing field. So I think this is really positive and it was also really encouraging to understand that the BMF is considering to, um, uh, to, to revisit this banking monopoly maybe for for platform lending in general then. So that was not really a question, but I, I, I wanted to comment <laughs> on it. <laughs> okay, are there, are there more questions? If not, then uh, I think Lars has the last word. All right, well then, if, if there are no more questions, let me please thank all of our panelists um, let me thank um, um, Lola Witt and Dennis Kutschuk, where is he over there, for organizing, for helping organizing this event. I think it was com absolutely um, reibungslos. I'm sorry for not knowing the English word right now. Um, and uh, thanks to Lindemann Schwenicke, our sponsor, uh, who, which, who, who provided this great venue and all the food we enjoyed and everything else. Um, and thanks to the audience for participating uh, and we're looking forward to maybe, hopefully, another crowd investing symposium in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>